Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together one more time, Lord. We thank you for keeping the circle unbroken, Lord. We thank you for blessing our day, blessing our fast, blessing our week all up until this point. You know the present and the future and the past all at the same time. So we thank you for being so such a wonderful God that supplies all of our needs and you take care of, we can cast all of our cares upon you. So right now, Father, we're praying right now for wisdom from on high that only you can provide, Lord. Help us to rightly divide this word of truth, Father. Help us to understand this word and let it sink into our spirit. And more than anything, Father, help each and every one of us apply this word to our mm. lives so mm. that we can live a better life. We can walk more like you, talk more like you, live more like you, give more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, just confirming, can you guys hear me? Yes. All right, cool. All right. All right, so. <laughs> Don't sit down, please. Uh -oh. Any of y'all got a chance to read John chapter 13 yet? Yes. All right. Would anybody like to open us up with that reading? I can. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, John chapter 13. Yeah. Jesus washes his disciples' feet. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, when it was time for supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas. Simon Iscariot's son to betray him. Jesus knew that the father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God and that he was going back to God. So he got up from supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel and tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and dry them with the towel tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I'm doing, you don't realize now, but afterward you will understand. You will never wash my feet, Peter said. Jesus replied, if I don't wash you, wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. One who has bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. This is why he said, not all of you are clean. The meaning of foot washing. When Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer clothing, he reclined again and said to them, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are speaking rightly, since that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. Truly I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master and a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I'm not speaking about all of you. I know those I have chosen, but scripture must be filled. The one who eats my bread has raised his heel against me. I'm telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. Truly, I tell you, whoever receives anyone I send receives me, and the one who receives me receives him who sent me. Judas's betrayal predicted. When Jesus had said this, he was troubled in the spirit and testified. Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples started looking at one another, uncertain which one he was speaking about. One of his disciples, the one Jesus loved, was reclining close beside Jesus. Simon Peter motioned to him to find out who it was he was talking about. So he leaned back against Jesus and asked him, Lord, who is it? 
Jesus replied, he's the one I give the piece of bread to after I have dipped it. When he had dipped up, when he had dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas, son of the scariest son, Simon the scariest son. After Judas ate the piece of bread, Satan entered him. So Jesus told him, what are you doing? What you're doing, do quickly. None of those reclining at the table knew why he said this to him. Since Judas kept the money back, some thought that Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the festival, or that he should give something to the poor. After receiving a piece of bread, he immediately left, and it was night. The new command, when he had left, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God would also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Children, I am with you a little while longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so now I tell you, where I'm going, you cannot go. You cannot come. I give you a new command. Love one another, just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Peter's denials predicted. Lord Simon Peter said to him, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Lord Peter said, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus replied, will you lay down your life for me? Should I tell you, a rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Amen. Amen. So of all that we just read in John chapter 13, does anybody want to share something that they've been, that they've, you know, gleaned from the scriptures through that reading? Uh, yes. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, yes. Good evening, everyone. Yes. I read this scripture before plenty of time, but I really did not understand what it means until now when I sat down earlier and I was reading it about washing, you know, the feet. And I just, it just amazed me to see how um, Jesus is so humble, you know, because he is the King of King and Lord of Lord. And uh, they were supposed to be washing his feet, but, you know, he was teaching, he was showing them an example and the things that they supposed to do. And, uh, you know, when he was reading, when I was reading about washing the feet, you know, he was saying that he already knew that uh, somebody was going to betray him. Um, Judas was going to betray him. So um, by him washing his feet, I guess he was trying to let him know that he got to be clean. You know, but not only do we have to be clean from the outside, we also got to be clean in the inside, you know, because we definitely have to have a pure heart and we have to be holy and righteous. So I guess he was just, you know, showing them an example on the way they should live, you know, how to serve one another. So that's the way I've seen it. Amen. Does anybody else want to share something? Well, it takes a lot of humility to do that, to be able to wash somebody's feet. And Jesus wanted to show them that, you know, yeah. because to love one another, you know, to show it, not by just saying, I love you, I love you, but show it, you know, in the things that we do for one another. I think he tried to convey that a lot in this chapter about love, 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 you know. But we don't have to do things in order for God to love us. You know, he just asks us to believe in who he is and what he was trying to also convey to them, you know, from what I read, you know, in the chapter to believe in him and love other people, no matter what. Even your enemies can love them, you know, do good to those who mistreat you. Amen. Amen. Anybody else got something they want to share? Yeah, I like um, what everybody has said. I um, personally was looking at that myself, you know, where it says, uh, by this you will know, they will know uh, you are my disciples. And so um, they will be recognized by being disciples by their love for one another. Mm -hmm. it, wasn't, it wasn't by their gifting. It wasn't by their titles. Mm -hmm. It was it was by the love. And I think about that in terms of church, you know, um, when, when people come to a church, uh, mm. the first thing that mm. they're going to know is whether 
the people are friendly, you mm -hmm. know, welcoming, loving. They they try to pick up on that, you know. Uh, not in our time, man. Uh, people don't come, you know, in a mature way. Uh, not all people. Uh, I'm talking about new converts. Don't come to the church looking to hear a good word. Mm -hmm. Amen. Right. They come for all mm -hmm. other reasons. Mm -hmm. And then when they get there, you know, uh, the word, the word is the word is what's going to ground them. But 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 they do need to sense the, the love of Jesus. They need to sense the love of Jesus. They need to sense the love of Jesus through the people. And they also want to sense the love of God or the love for God through the preacher. You know, so. Definitely, um, they be looking at that. Mm -hmm. Amen. So we have to represent that, you know, in the world. Man, when when we come together, you know, and, and I, what I like about even Restored Passion, and I ain't boasting on us, but when we together, you know, and we talking about Jesus, you know, and, and we really, you know, are genuinely with one another, people recognize that. We was, we was at a restaurant sitting down, and we was all sitting together. We had some tables. And man, we got into a discussion about Jesus. And the lady came over there. She heard me and Devin. And then Devin, she heard us talking. She said, I had, she said she was a new believer. And she said that she don't see that all the time. Amen. She don't see people Amen. talking about Jesus mm -hmm. in, in public places. Yeah. You know, so so yeah. that's what that's what we want to represent. We want to represent people that are Christ-like everywhere that we go connected to people who are Christ-like. Amen. 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 That's all I had from that point there. Um, I, I wanted to share, um, in those times, foot washing, the commentary talks about uh, was reserved for the most menial of servants. So in his example, Jesus was saying, you know, even though we may see ourselves as equal because I think people have a tendency to want to see themselves as equal to everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, but Jesus demonstrated, they didn't have a problem with like washing Jesus's feet because they saw him as superior, but they would definitely have an issue with washing each other's feet. People mm -hmm. they perceive as being their peers. And sometimes when we walk That's into good. churches and different settings, we want to see ourselves as equal mm -hmm. instead of Jesus following Jesus's example, who was the greatest of all. And he said, whoever wants to be great must be servant of them all. And so mm -hmm. he's modeling a leadership that is very different than what you see in the Roman government um, at that time and very different and, and in the religious, the Jewish, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and very different even in our time when we look at government today or we look at corporations today, business governments. They're, the leadership usually wants to be served instead of really seeing certain that they need to be serving others that they need to be making the greatest sacrifice. Yeah. And I think in our culture in America, we, we, we strive to be um, equal to or better than others. So we don't want to take the lowly job, but Jesus illustrates that that is actually the greatest person, mm -hmm. the one who's willing to serve. Amen, amen, that's good. You know, even their, even their, the way they sat, if you would uh, study the way they were seated and their feet uh, faced outward, their heads were um, mid chest. So when they, when they, when they kneeled over and they said that the disciples were conversing among themselves and one kneel, um, um, bent over to speak to Jesus or to speak to the other disciples, it's, it's almost a, uh, 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 a lower lower ring of self, you know. It's almost a, a lower ring of self. I guess that's why um, he says that the greater will be the servant, right? You know, the the humble will be lifted up. 
The pride, mm -hmm. the prideful will be brought down, but the humble will be exalted, you know. And so, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot into that. I know Devin got some stuff he want to bring up, but I know it's a, probably a whole lot that that we can find if we just dig deep. Amen. Amen. Also, like this, this this last thing I'm gonna say, um, and 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 this may um, may or may not be. Uh, uh, proper context, but I noticed, you know, Jesus, you know, he said to, uh, said to the disciples, he said to him, uh, if I don't uh, wash all of you, uh, what do you say? If, if I don't wash you, you can have no part. Of me. If I don't wash you, you can have no part of me. And then what did Peter, Peter said, you know what? Wash my, wash my whole, body. whole body. And that's kind of the, uh, the attitude, the posture of the heart, I believe, the humility that we have when we say, you know what, God, you can have all of me, right? Mm -hmm. Because washing, really, in Scripture, a lot of time when they talk about washing, like like a husband's supposed to wash his wife with the Word, right? He's talking about ministering the Word of God. The Word of God washes and cleanses us, you know. And I just think about, um, you know, my own personal life. You know, I got a lot of areas I, I walk with God. You know, I, I, and I say that humbly, and I walk with God. I'm very godly. But I got some areas where I need to work on that God wants to wash me. God wants to help me to, to, to uh, get my health together, right? He wants me to help me to not doubt, right? Not to fear. You know, it's some areas in my life, and I'm just speaking from my own personal experiences, that, that God wants to wash. And I have to continue to say, you know what, God, wash all of me. Yeah. Yeah. Because if, if God can't have all of me, he won't be able to use me the way that he wants to. Mm -hmm. He needs all of us. He needs our whole heart. He needs for us to love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Amen. That's what he needs. Amen. And another another now did you see Jesus Jesus knew their hearts and he knew that they were they were he said you were clean already. You know uh but and but when we go through this life when we go on our journey, uh, as our feet, yeah, they get a little dirty, and so that's what what it is. We we wash one another as we come together uh, uh, as as servants, loving one another. Then we wash each other with the word and yeah. with the love, yeah. And then then we're ready because he has already done the work in us. But it's just our feet in our daily uh, life, and that, and and I look at he did. I would imagine he did Judas's feet too, uh, and Amen. so that's that's showing love to the one who who's going to betray you. Yeah, and uh, it, it's just uh, Jesus being our perfect example is just showing us that love is is it. If you're connected to that vine. And then you produce that fruit. Now all that fruit is is love. Yeah. And so we that's how we go with where people can 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 taste that fruit and then uh, uh want to want to glorify the Father in heaven. Amen. Anybody else want to share something? All right, can we get the um can we get some of my notes pulled up for chapter 13? Yeah, I got some you the, right now. Um, some of the stuff we kind of already covered, but like when we was reading chapter, I kind of got a couple other things that I didn't necessarily write down or type up when I did the listen. So see if we can get a little more context because this is a really good chapter. Mm -hmm. yeah, man. All right, so that first part, we kind of pretty much already talked about that. But I just kind of came from the perspective of, you know, this was more of a convert, even though all the disciples were there together. I believe like the context or the, the, the conversation was between necessarily Peter and Jesus, because it, it didn't say that, you know, necessarily that anybody else was talking. So Peter was, well, he was talking to Jesus as in like a, a surprise manner, right? And I think Apostle Kimberly talked about this as well as Minister Hal as well, where it's like, you know, someone of your status, like, why are you washing our feet? 
Like, why, why would you be doing this? It, it makes no sense. It wasn't questioning the action of washing feet. It was questioning, like, why are you doing this, right? Because that 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 word you, or at least in my translation, the word you is capitalized. So it's almost like that was a, um, an emphatic statement. Like, are you washing my feet? Why would you be doing this? But then we already talked about the fact that it's just him being that example. So he's modeling that correct heart posture, right? Mm -hmm. So I think some of you guys talked about it where when it comes to love, it's not just action or just word. It's also a heart posture, mm -hmm. right? So the heart posture that's required. Is this, uh, okay. So the heart posture that's required as a believer, I think that's what he was showing us in the fact that you must wash people's feet, right? But even more so the church. It appears just like it's, you know, it's, it could be, you know, the physical act of washing feet, but it also is the physical act of just supporting others, right? right. Giving your time, giving that, you know, giving that extra, going that extra mile. And we see that played out a lot more through our scripture where he tells us, you know, if a man tells you to walk within one mile, go with him too. If a man slaps you on the cheek, you know what I'm saying? Turn the other cheek to him. Right. But it's all about having the correct heart posture. Like these are the outward actions, but the inward process is what he's mostly focused on. Right. So he was showing them the heart posture. Like it doesn't matter, you know, what promotions you go through, because obviously these 12 people or 11 at this time, these 11 people, they're disciples, but they're going to soon become apostles. Right. Soon Jesus is going to not be on the earth and they're going to be the authority on everything scripture, everything gospel. And if these guys fail in their mission, the gospel doesn't spread. So it's so important for them to get this lesson down right now before he can away, right? And that's their heart posture. So I, I was thinking that it's not so much about the action itself of washing feet, but rather about the willingness to serve in spite of your status, right? I think that's something that we see impacting a lot of ministries today, whereas, you know, because of a certain status, we just don't, we don't want to be seen doing certain things, right? And it's good to have a team of ministers. It's good to share the load and things like that because you want people to grow in their gift and use what they have. But I, I, for me, I just think that even as a leader, you should be willing to do those things that you started off doing, right? If you started off feeding the poor, why are, or somehow you may have a team that helps you do this, but why are you not out there? Mm. You know, it, it's almost like it's like a, um, it's just a, mind, it's a mindset thing. It's almost like you think that you think that you're above it. And Jesus is showing us that, like, I'm not too big to get low, right? Though I am high, you know, Amen. I'm the highest of highs, but I'm going to get low and wash your feet. But I don't have to. But this is what this is what you ought to be doing, because now you guys are going to become the new apostles. You guys are going to be in my position. I'm going to go up to heaven and you guys are going to be this authority on these things that are spiritual. There's going to be people coming to you that you're going to like, you're not going to like, they're going to betray you, different things are going to happen. And this is the hard posture that you must have so that this mission will be successful. Amen. And then when we look at, you know, John 13 and 16, he pretty much says it right, you know, plainly to us. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. And initially, I just put that scripture in there to kind of, you know, Proof, proof takes the point of, you know, washing the feet. But when you read it this time, I kind of got a little bit more out of it because the scripture is telling us he already knows that Judas is going to betray him. Right. He's preparing to actually announce that it's Judas or not. He's not going to say his name, but he's going to do a certain action which signifies that Judas is going to betray him. So Jesus already knows this. And obviously Judas knows who he is. But also you got to realize the person that we're not talking about in the scripture is Satan. He's he's there. He's present. He's there. He's somewhere in that in that room, sitting in the heart of Judas, waiting for his opportunity. And Jesus is telling us right here. He's reminding them. He's like, I'm telling you, a servant is not greater than his master. To me, that's like that's speaking directly to the devil. You know, we're your creator. He says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. So even though you think that you're about to win this battle. You think that you're about to conquer me. You think that you're about to put this to an end. I'm telling you, a servant is not greater than his master. And then he says, nor is he, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. That's addressing Judas. I sent you to do these great works. I gave you a power. I gave you authority. I gave you anointing. But now you're about to lift your heel up against me as if you're finna, you know, somehow usurp me. It's the same thing that happened in heaven, right? 
The devil was created. He was given a power, authority, anointing. And then he tried to lift up his heel against God, got cast down. And now he's entering the heart of Judas to do the same thing again, except he's using Judas to do it. So I think that text right there is almost he's talking to both of them like Satan. You did this. And I've shown you before that no matter who you are, a servant can never be greater than his master. Right. But then also, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. Because I sent you, Judas. That's what being an apostle is, a person that's sent. So we, I sent you to do these things, but somehow you think you're going to be greater than me. Right. So I just I thought that was more very important. Um, the second part is, and I'm just kind of just taking scriptures. It's not necessarily points just yet, but the second scripture that kind of spoke out to me or gave me more things to think about was, it says, he who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. And I just was focusing on that word heel because I was thinking back to Genesis chapter three. And in Genesis chapter three, that's when the fall of man occurred. And after the fall of man, there was three curses. God cursed three different people. First, he cursed man. He cursed Adam and Eve, right? And then he cursed the serpent, which was the physical animal. And then lastly, he cursed the serpent, serpent, which is Satan, the one who entered the serpent, right? So there was three curses that took place. Most specifically, I want to focus on that third one when he's cursing the devil, right? So in Genesis chapter three, verse 15, this is him talking directly to Satan. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. And this, obviously, this is not a whole passage. This is just one portion of it. But he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And I had, I started thinking about that because I'm like, okay, we see this in the text. We see this in Genesis. Why is this same word used? Because we don't see that word often. We don't see lifted up your heel against me. Right. There's been many, you know, many battles, many people that's turned away, many people that's betrayed different people. But we don't see that specific language except in Genesis. And it's almost like Genesis was the pro like it was like a prophetic utterance against what was going to happen in this New Testament. Right. Because Jesus is the seed of the woman. He is that, that, that new covenant. He's the seed of the woman. But then also the seed of the of the serpent is now Judas. Right. He's the enemy. He's the new enemy to this new covenant. Right. So then if that's the case, then I'm looking at it. I'm like, OK, why did Jesus say what he said? He said, he who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. And initially, I didn't know how to take it because I'm like, I don't want to say the wrong words. But the more I look at it, it's just it seems to me like this is Jesus because like he knows what's going to happen. Right. He knows exactly what's going to happen. He knows that he's going to be crucified. He knows that Judas is going to help do it. He knows what the devil is doing. He knows everything. So it's almost like because he knows, he's guiding that process along. Right? He's not surprised by it. He's actually guiding it along because he knows if I could just get Satan to continue with his plan, we win. Because the only thing that could have been worse is if Satan figures out that if he goes to the cross, and he dies for, you know, dies right now, then I lose the war forever. So it's like, I'm guiding you down this path, even though you don't know it. Like he doesn't even realize that God is still in control. He thinks he's winning. And it just reminds me of what Jesus is saying right here, because he said, he who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. But in the context, it says that he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So even in the context of Genesis chapter three, it let us know correctly that you can never win. Like you can never lift up your heel against him. It's, 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 it's impossible, right? You can never lift up your head against the seed, of the, the seed of the woman. So then when it comes to this context, why is Jesus saying this? And it just, it just for me, it just felt like he was guiding that process along because it, the context is telling you that Jesus is going to bruise the seed of Satan, but the seed of Satan was going to bruise the heel of Jesus. Not win, but bruise his heel. Right. Because it, obviously from that from that picture, from that imagery, the devil, his demons, anything that's of the darkness is under his feet. They will they will always be under his feet. So then when I remember, remember what he said, this would have made Satan himself think that he was winning. Right. Because he says he who has lifted, who has ebrez with me, lifted up his heel against me. Yeah. If you lifting up your heel against somebody, that means that you're actually above them. That means that they're under you. 
So if Satan is at this table, if he's sitting inside the heart of Judas, if he's hearing these things and guiding his journey along, when Jesus says this, this would have made him think, okay, I'm actually about to do this. I'm actually about to win, right? right? And then right. if I look at that part, and then, because you guys are just reading Genesis chapter 13, uh, John chapter 13, and then he said this. He says, whatever you do, do quickly. I'm like, what? Okay. So he says, whatever you do, do quickly. Because what I know is this, right? A lot of times we go through spiritual warfare. A lot of times we go through um, temptations, trials, tribulations. And the enemy, what he'll try to do is he'll, maybe he'll try to plant a thought, right? Maybe he'll try to put a, 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 the wrong mentality into your heart and you have to fight against it, right? The scripture tells us to cast down vile imaginations and anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, right? So if he's trying to do these things, then you must be wondering, okay, he's trying to put these things into your heart, but you're supposed to reject these things. Mm -hmm. But then you look at what Satan is doing, right? Because he says, whatever you do, do quickly. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like he was talking to Judas, right? I know what you're thinking. I know what he just put inside your heart. So instead of you thinking about it and considering it and trying to discern whether it's the right thing to do or the right wrong thing to do, just go ahead and do it quickly so that we can get this thing over with. So for me, like that was in my mind, just showing that Jesus is in control, but he's pushing that process along. Let's get this all out the way because I'm going to die for sin. And then all of this thing is going to actually come to fruition. As opposed to if they thought about it too long, they might have realized, OK, something is wrong here. Because just me reading this, it's like, why would Jesus be okay with dying? But he knows, right? We know that he knows what's going on. That's why he's okay. That's why he's, you know, God in that process alone. But they may not know that at the time. You know, so that's just one thing that was speaking to me when I was looking at those, those couple passages. And then this next part, he says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. And when it came to that, I'm like, okay, who he who receives whomever I send receives me. And this is, you know, I'm thinking because Jesus, obviously he's the son of God, but then Jesus himself is God as well. So if Jesus is God, he was sent by God, right? Mm -hmm. He says, he who receives who I send receives me. Now, when we talk about washing the feet and cleaning the heart, Obviously, there's two parts that go into there, right? There's the, there's the part that you get at salvation, which is you receive Jesus's righteousness, but then he gives you the helper, the Holy Spirit, which is supposed to guide us into all truth, which is supposed to keep us, you know, keep our path clean, right? It keeps our path clean because he teaches us truth and he keeps us from doing those things which we may not know is wrong at the time because he's supposed to guide us into all truth. So when it looks at Judas and these different disciples, you can think that the other 11, not only are they clean, but they have received the Holy Spirit, right? They were opened up to it. They were opened up to the cleansing of the spirit, but Judas wasn't, right? This is not saying that he wasn't washed physically, right? He was washed physically. He had a portion with the apostles, right? He was chosen by God, but in his heart, he wasn't clean and he wasn't submitted to Jesus to be clean because he says, he who receives whomever I send receives me. So he wasn't even receiving Jesus. He, he had something against Jesus. He was offended. And because he was offended, that's why he you know, ended up in this whole conspiracy to kill Jesus. But then he says, he who receives me receives him who sent me. So this is showing us that difference between the, the 12 apostles, but then Judas, right? The one who got you know, left aside. He who receives whom I send receives me. And he who receives me receives the one who sent me. So he's talking about the Trinity right here, right? If you receive me, then you receive me and my spirit. However, if you don't receive me, you don't have me, but you also don't have the father, which we saw in like earlier chapters of John as well. So a lot of people may not understand, you know, what is going on with Judas? Because he is an apostle, right? He does have authority. He does have anointing. He did cast out demons. He did a lot of great works, but his heart never changed. And that's just showing us once again that it really doesn't matter the works that we do. It doesn't matter, you know, what it looks like on the outside. It comes down to the heart because you can do all these great things. But if you're not submitted to God from the heart, it amounts to nothing because obviously Satan was able to enter him. Right. 
And that shouldn't happen. Like Satan shouldn't be able to enter you. Now, can he tempt you? I mean, he can tempt whoever he wants to, but he shouldn't be able to enter you. He just like literally just walked into his heart and, and made him do something. I was like a position. Mm-hmm. And we don't never see Satan possess nobody. Like mm-hmm. this is the only time in all of scripture that Satan possesses anybody. It just doesn't happen. But he possessed Judas. So I think that was that's very important to look at. And then when it looks at John chapter 13, verse 10 through 11, Jesus says to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but he's completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. So he was speaking to Judas specifically, right? He's like, you guys, all you need to do is wash your feet. All you need to do is wash it, you know, watch your path. Right. I, I try to think of it from the from the perspective of like what does it mean to wash your feet in the physical, right? Because he says he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet. You've already been made clean, so you don't have to be made clean. You don't have to receive my righteousness again. You have that, but you need to watch your path. But the one who is not watching his path is the one who's going to betray me, which is Judas, because we know what Judas was doing. He was stealing money out of the treasury, right? He wasn't living clean. Though he had Jesus' righteousness, mm-hmm. though he believed in Jesus, though he did miracles and, and signs and all these things, he was still stealing from the money box. So he was still holding on to his sins while walking with the Savior that was to forgive sins, whereas the other 11 had put those things away. And I think that just kind of brings more context into that. But does anybody want to discuss any of those you know, first three things that we covered? No, but that was definitely good. Amen. All right, can you scroll down a little bit? Cool. All right, so number four is this. He says, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. And I was thinking, you know, that kind of speaks to two different realities. Because obviously, you know, Jesus is like the captain of salvation, right? Now, this is not saying that Jesus has to be saved, but he was here to be our example. So he showed the disciples and the apostles, you know, I have to die to my flesh so that I can receive this greater glory that's within heaven. Right. So he says, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you can follow me afterward. But he says, you shall follow me afterward. Right. That, that also speaks to like Romans 10, 9 and 10. Right. He says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. So he's not saying you might be saved, you shall. That's that's it's almost he's saying it's gonna happen, right? If you do these things, it's gonna happen. And he's speaking to his apostles right now. He says, Where I'm going, you can't follow me right now, but you shall follow me afterward. So he's saying, I'm not gonna lose none of y'all. The only one that's gonna be lost is the one who's not clean, which is Judas. But the rest of y'all are definitely going. Y'all, y'all are coming with me. It's just not happening right now. Mm-hmm. So The first thing is he has to die and rise again, because when he does this, then we can die to our flesh and receive his righteousness. But that also helps us to get into heaven because we can't get into heaven without being fully righteous. Right. Because he who has transgressed the law in one part has transgressed the whole law. So only with Jesus's righteousness are we able to enter into heaven. So that's the first thing. But then the second thing is that He's speaking to Peter, right? We, are, we already discovered that this is a, a conversation between Peter and Jesus. So Peter's faith wasn't even valid at this point, right? He did believe in Jesus, but he hasn't been tested. He hasn't went through a trial yet. And he's going to go through his trial right after this, right? When he says, the rooster shall crow three times before, I mean, you shall deny me three times before the rooster crows. So before this, this, you know, this rooster makes his noise, you're going to already deny me three times. You just went from Jesus, I'm, I'm fired up. I'm going to die with you. And the next moment you're saying, I don't know this man. Even in one of the examples, it said he start cussing. He, he start talking crazy. He's like, man, I don't, I don't know this dude at all. You could just imagine the words he was speaking. I don't know if he was scared. I don't know what was happening, but he denied Jesus three different times. They were like, you know, you're a Galilean. You speak his language. You have to know him. He's like, I don't know this man from a can of paint. I don't know nothing about him. So this is the same man that says, Jesus, we're going to die with you. And then just a few moments later, he don't want to do anything like that. He don't even want to come close. Right. He he couldn't stand to be in that. So he's like, "Okay, Peter's faith has to be valid before he can even endure his own crucifixion. 
right? Because that's what we know now. We know that Peter was crucified and he was actually crucified upside down, yeah. right? And this is some of the things that we look at in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 through 13, it says, and this is, I think this is Peter after, like, after the fact. So, you know, 1 Peter was written years after this, 30, 40 years after this. So he's like, beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. See, I don't think Peter understood this at that time. Like before he wrote this, when he was when Jesus was going to the cross, he didn't understand this. They wrote these letters in A.D. 50, A.D. 60, you know, 20, 30 years after Jesus' death, after they had been apostles for some time, after they had established churches, after they had done multiple things. That's when he finally understood. Like, our faith consistently be tested, right? But until your faith is really tested, who's to say it's valid or not? No, who's to say? So don't think it's strange when the fiery trial comes upon you because it has to. Your faith has to be validated, right? Amen. Then we look at John 21, verse 18 through 19. It says, most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, and this is this is Jesus talking to Peter. I know I'm, I'm skipping ahead, but bear with me right here. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So in this context, this is when after Jesus, uh, Peter had denied Jesus three times and he went back to fishing. And then after Jesus resurrected, he met, G he met Peter and James on the shore and he actually cooked fish on the coals and he spoke to Peter directly. And he's like, you know, son of, si son of Simon, do you love me? Right. He's like, God, you know, I love you. You know, everything, you know, you know, whatever, whatever. And he, he, he spoke. I love you three different times. Right. So this is what Jesus was saying at that time. But then you got to put all the context together, because there's a reason why Peter denied him three times. He wasn't willing to be crucified. I don't know if he was scared. I don't know if it was just a maturity thing, but he just he couldn't go through that. He had just said, wherever you go, he said, Lord, where are you going? We'll die with you. He's like, oh, you're going to die for me. We'll see. He said, like, you know, I, surely as I'm telling you, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. You're not about to die with me. You, you're not ready for that yet because Jesus already knows how you're supposed to die. So Peter is, he's thinking, right? He's seeing Jesus about to be crucified. They are torturing him. They are beating him. They are spitting on him. They are slapping on him. I don't want none parts of that. He couldn't take it at this time. But later on, right, as he become an apostle, as he become more mature, as his faith has been tested time and time again, because, you know, Peter goes to jail multiple times. He gets saved multiple times. Right. The angels came and free him from his chains a couple of times. So Peter had been through a lot by the time he wrote first Peter. When he wrote this letter, he had already understood that my faith is tried and true. He says you shall come out as, as pure gold. When your faith has been tested, you come out as pure gold. Right. But it has to be tested. So I think that's the two realities that he was speaking to, the fact that we have to die to our flesh and rise again in the spirit to get into heaven. But the second part is that all of our faith has to be valid, right? And he was speaking to Peter about, you know, you're about to get crucified, but you're not ready for this shit. You say you're ready to die for me, but you're not really. You, you don't understand what that truly means. But then as Peter does it, he shows all the other apostles how to do it as well, right? So that's one thing I, I was seeing from chapter 13. How about chapter 14? Who wants to help us read that one? All right, so I'll read John chapter 14. You guys just try to, um, I don't know, get, get, get something to uh, talk about with John chapter 14. I think I got like maybe two points, but um, let's, try to, let's try to really turn this discussion up. But the, the subtitle says, the way, the truth, and the life. It says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God and believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. 
that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words and the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you, and my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I am going to my Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the father and as the father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. All right, so that was John chapter 14. Does anybody want to share anything that they've gleaned from that text? Uh, I wanted to go back to um, when Peter uh, betrayed Jesus. Yeah, I, I really believe that Peter was scared. You know, he was scared that maybe, you know, the people probably would, you know, hurt him. So, yeah, he was afraid. I believe so. And I feel like um, sometime it'd be like, it, it'd be like in the church, like, you know, a lot of people, like when, when they're around church people, you know, they talk about God, you know, we, they worship. But when they go outside in the world, you know, they don't want people to know that they are Christian because of what people might think or what people might say, you know, and I feel like that's how it be sometime, you know, out here now. I mean, that's how it be in the church sometime. But I really believe, you know, uh, we are definitely living in the last day. So this time now is when people really need to hear about Jesus. You know, this is the time that we need to stand strong and we need to be bold and not be afraid or not be ashamed, you know, because you know, it's a lot going on in this world. So this is the time that we need to go out there, you know, preaching the gospel, telling people about Jesus, you know, and really standing bold, you know, and uh, standing strong in our faith. Amen. No, I, def I, think, I definitely think that point is valid. You know, I, I didn't know necessarily what it was, but, you know, it, it definitely could be fear because, I mean, a lot of people, man, I've seen it, man. I've seen people say a lot of crazy stuff, man. 
Like I can just imagine like when you just think about Peter and his, his mentality at this time following Jesus, he's yeah. fired up, right? He's seeing miracles. He's seeing all kinds of stuff. He's like, man, I was just a fisherman. And now look at all this, look at all this stuff. Yep. You know, this is the person we've been waiting on for hundreds of years. And he happens to choose me. Like all of these guys were doing their own thing. None of them were in the church. None of them were scribes, Pharisees, nothing. They were, they had no like status in the religious world. They were just regular people. And it's like, look at all this stuff that's happening. So of course he's fired up. He's like, God, I'll follow you anywhere. And Jesus like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're not really, you don't know what you're saying, right? You, you don't, you have no clue what you're actually saying because you don't know what it means to follow me, right? And for us, you know, following Jesus is dying to our flesh. But there could come a time where, you know, we must suffer physical death. We, we really don't know. But I think it's also that maturity, right? Because from the maturity perspective, Peter wasn't necessarily mature in his faith at this time. They were all like, as you would qu qualify as baby Christians, right? Even though they were disciples and apostles, they haven't had their faith tested enough to actually stand firm in the face of that trouble, right? Mm -hmm. I think even the, the first disciple to die was James, right? The brother of John. So he was the first one to actually die. But up until this point, none of them had really been tested or went through no trial or tribulation. So they were just teaching, learning, growing, right? And a lot of times that's what we stop at in the church. We come to church and we just teach, we learn, we grow, but we never actually go out into the world and actually endure those tests. Because as your faith gets tested, that's where we get like this, this, the word of spiritual warfare, right? It's like everything you do, the, the, the enemy wants you to go in one direction, but God is telling you to go in this other direction. The Holy Spirit is convicting you of a certain path, but your flesh is, you know, welcome to a different path. And that's like that warfare, that's that tug between the flesh and the spirit. And it, it's for me, it's, I wouldn't say it scares me, but it just shows what times we're in because you, see, you speak to so many people and they're like, I don't go through spiritual warfare. They don't even believe the devil is even real. I'm like, I don't know what you've been doing. Like, I don't like even the simple stuff, like the enemy doesn't want you to share the gospel. So clearly you're not sharing the gospel. If he don't come against you, you're not sharing the gospel, right? Clearly you're not anointed. You might have some kind of gift, but if the enemy's not trying to stop what you're doing, it's not having no effect. So it's like for that, for you to say you're not going through spiritual warfare, that just shows like a lot of people are no, no real threat to the kingdom of darkness. There's nobody truly being saved. Uh, and that's one thing we have to be so focused on like yeah. it doesn't matter necessarily how good we speak Amen. how bad we speak just as long as it's effective because yeah. i just you know think about the apostle paul he's like they, they wrote a letter and they said you know you you kind of small like in in person you're not as big as you yeah. sound in your letters you you look kind of frail you're not you're not like that and paul is like it don't matter bro because <laughs> at the end of the day people being saved yeah people yeah. being transformed people being set free and people are growing in Christ. So yeah. it doesn't matter what I look like. It doesn't matter what my speech impediment is. It doesn't matter. People are actually being saved. Amen. That's true goal, you know? I know I kind of said a lot. But does anybody else want to share what, they, what they've gotten? Amen. No, that was good. I want to share something real quick. Um, um, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, for us to, to share, uh, share the gospel. Um, I think we have to take a stand, you know, take a stand um, as believers, you know, it's, we, we are quick, you know, believers do this a lot, you know, we're quick to, uh, to, to take a stand when it's uh, something um, that we as brothers and sisters in Christ do, um, but then we need to take a stand against some of the things that are going on in the world. And so they recently had, and what I'm talking about, they recently had a drag queen uh, I don't know if you saw the article or, or, or the, the clipping, but a drag queen was teaching in a public school, teaching kids in a public school, in a, in a public library, public library, thank you, babe. And, you know, as, as believers, we could see things like that and be like, okay, you know, we just gotta pray, you know? <laughs> and prayer is the foundation of things, but at some point our prayer should cause us to act. Mm -hmm. And what happened was some some Houston pastors, and I'm glad we moving over to Houston because we're going to connect with some of them pastors. They bought the business. So what they did was they came together and made a um, got a law passed that drag queens can no longer do that again. 
You know, Man. the same way they got another law, uh, law uh, thing uh, that they're trying to stop having them shows and stuff like that with kids, you know, there because it's 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 affecting it's affecting them kids. You know, they being indoctrinated, thinking that that's that's okay. You know, it's okay to um, be same sex marriage. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's okay. You know, they think that it's okay. Cross dressing. Go ahead, babe. It's okay to okay to draw stress. So so we got to be able to take a stand too. Um, and I was encouraged to see that that one little small group of pastors, mm -hmm. you know, um, at the day at my meeting, um, I didn't meet them, but I was with some pastors and, and they was talking about this one little small group of pastors that came together and they put some amendments or whatever they did together and they got a law passed, you know, and they stopped the madness, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. as believers, we got we gotta preach the gospel and be about. The father's yeah. business. Yeah. 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 We gotta be about the father's business. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm gonna put the scripture up. Where is it? Also, I like uh just want to comment on what you shared because I think that also shows you like kind of what side you're on. Because yeah. and I'm not necessarily trying to attack these preachers or pastors or whatever, but man, there's so many people that got books coming out movies coming out all these different mediums where they're sharing some form of the word but they don't have no stances that go against the world like yeah. it's easy to take a stance when the world is going to defend you like it's yeah. easy to say i don't like trump that's the easiest thing to say like people think they're becoming super spiritual by saying stuff like that and it's like i mean i guess but brother you're not speaking against none of this stuff that the world hates because right. if you speak against the stuff that the world don't want you to talk about, that's when you go through censorship. Mm -hmm. I've seen so many ministries get censored. They've been demonetized. They've been shut down off YouTube, off Facebook. They can't reach nobody because what they're saying is reaching people. Yeah. And the enemy is threatened by that. Mm -hmm. He's not threatened by, like, there's nothing wrong with preaching the gospel. That's our foundation. But if that's all you ever do, you're only doing half the battle. Yeah. The Bible talks about more than just salvation. It talks about sin. It talks about, you know, wickedness. It talks about workers of, of, of iniquity. And we don't never want to address those things because it threatens our crowd, right? right? If I speak against these things, I don't reach as many people or I don't, I don't, I don't put as much money into my pockets. Yeah. I, I saw a recent pastor the other day, he's putting out a new book and I'm just, <laughs> God forgive me, but man, I, I just, I got fresh. I'm like, why, why are you putting out a book? Like, I don't want to say his name because I don't want to become personal, but I'm like, the title of the book was speaking as if he had been through some kind of warfare. It was like, um, kind of like, you know, how Paul talked about like being hard pressed, but not persecuted, crushed, but not in despair. I'm like he was talking about going through persecution. He's talking about standing up for the word of God and going through trial. Like I'm getting whipped for the, for the, for the cross. I've been stoned for the cross. I've been shipwrecked for the cross. You know, right. I've been talked to crazy. I've been, I've been, they, they haven't fed me. Right. I've been treated less than for the cross, for the work of the gospel. And you writing this book as if you've been through that, bro. All your stances are pro world. You ain't going through nothing like you sitting in a big old house, yeah. not suffering. You don't have no stances that go against the world. So they're not coming against you. And these are the same people that say, you know, they don't know that the devil is really real. You know, they don't know if spiritual warfare is a thing. They, they just don't believe these things. I'm like. It, it don't take that you have to believe it. Just start living for God and you'll see it. Because yeah. yeah. I kid you not, like when, when I got saved, I wasn't trying to do anything. I just started talking what I was reading. I'm like, I read it. Then I just, it's something just like came out of me. Like I mm -hmm. saw certain things and I said something and it's like, it offended people. Mm -hmm. They were mad. Like, who do you think yeah. you are? Why are you saying that to me? You think you're better than me? And I'm like, bro, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what I was saying. And I'm like, why are yeah. you so angry? If it's the truth, it's the truth. Yeah. People were so hurt, man. They were just so mad, bro. I mean, family, relationships, people yeah. that you thought you would never lose. Yeah. You actually have to make a choice between God and your family. Right, right. right? And pe people don't go through stuff like that. So it's like, I, this made me think, in these last days, whose faith is really valid? Right. Right. Like everybody can preach. Anybody can get up there and repeat what the Bible says. Right. But who can stand firm when there's no Bible left? Right. Yeah. Let's say right. if they outlaw church, if they outlaw going to church, if they outlaw having these Christian conferences, if they outlaw reading the Bible, who's going to stand firm? Amen. Amen. That's what I'm looking for. That's it. Yeah.
Yeah. I want to say real quick about uh, verse 15, uh, 21, and uh, 23, where Jesus is, he said to them three times to keep his commands and how important it is. And the only way you're going to keep the commands is if you're in the word of God. Because a lot of times people are not in the word. But when you're in the word, the more God reveals to you. You know, sometimes when I'm having my time with the Lord in the morning, or whenever it may be, I was like, Lord, I want to see you. Lord, show me something new about you. You know, I just love the word of God and I stand on it and um, not for anybody not to try to water it down. It is what it is. It's what he said it is. There's no gray area. And I was reading something the other night about the, the how, what was the word? The cost, like the dichotomy. Dichotomy which I had never really heard that word in the thing, but it was just talking about uh, the middle area, the subtle ways that Satan can come across. It was like, okay, like you're either, you're for God or you're not for God. Uh, you're following him, you're not following. And how there's no gray area. And a lot of people think that there is. Mm -hmm. And because God is good that it, he's not a God of justice, you know, but he is, you know? Yeah. So I, I just want to just, put that out there, how, how important it is to make sure that we're in the word and grounded in the word and rooted in the word of God so that we can, um, you know, just just he could reveal more of himself to us. Yeah. Amen. And, and I, I'd like to say again uh, that uh, when, when we are approaching uh, people concerning the gospel, uh, see, Jesus don't love sin. When we approach the people, we have to let them know that they have broken a law. Uh, a holy God, the creator of heaven and earth and the creator of us all, we have broken a law. And that one day we got to pay. Mm -hmm. Now, when that day comes, are we going to be ready? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in order to be ready, we need a savior. And so we let them know that, yeah, someone has paid that price. Lord. Yeah. Someone, if you told a lie, I don't care when it was, where it was, if you done lust, lusted, if you've done whatever you have done, uh, yeah, you may have be a good person, yeah, but still, if you don't have a savior that mm. that that covers all of whatever you have done in the blood, oh, then you go into hell, yeah, and so that's yeah, that's what God wants us to present the law mm -hmm. to them to show them and let them know that there's a savior. You don't have to spend your day in hell, your, your eternity in hell. Yeah. Because there's a savior. And so let them know then, then they have that fear. Yeah. Oh no, I don't want to die. Yeah. But if we, if we preach it, Oh, Jesus loves you. Mm -hmm. Jesus love God will do all. Yeah. If, if we go to him that way. Yeah. They'll Remember that? Yeah, they already having fun with the with the, the sins that they do. Yeah, what is God going to do? Yeah, it, 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 he already, oh, he's not going to uh, do this if he's a loving God. No, you let him know. No, he, if, unless you get yourself together, unless you put on Christ, you 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 out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to piggyback off of what, what Marsha was saying. I think this passage in John chapter 14 deals with a lot of, of, and John overall deals with Jesus's role as a son, mm -hmm. that he is giving us an example of sonship and being, being um, the first example of sonship for us because we are our sons, those who believe mm -hmm. and have followed and obey his commands and trust in Christ as our Lord. Mm -hmm. um, we are sons. And so he, he, he talks about this, especially in chapter 14. He deals with the um, struggle. There's the struggle mm -hmm. that Judas has of rebelliousness, mm -hmm. which we wrestle with if we don't understand our identity. Mm -hmm. And then there's this other hand, a struggle of orphanhood, where we take on the view of the world about ourselves and we don't truly recognize our identity. So I think specifically um, Jesus talks about his father's house mm -hmm. and he talks about 
there being many mansions in verse two. Then he talks about um, the Holy Spirit in verse, I think it's verse 12 where he says, no, it's in verse 17 where he says the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive mm -hmm. because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. Mm -hmm. And so this is the struggle, the human struggle mm -hmm. that we wrestle with um, as uh, people on, on earth. If we wrestle between being re rebels, mm -hmm. rebelling against God and following our simple nature mm -hmm. and being orphans, not understanding who we are, who, mm -hmm. what our purpose is, what we were created to be. And so Jesus came to resolve that by being the perfect example of a son mm -hmm. who was loved by his father mm -hmm. and, 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 and so loved that he was willing to yield to his father's will, take on his father's purposes, even to the point of death. And he yeah. wants us all to do that, to give up what we consider ours, our life, Amen. and follow our father yeah. who is greater. Yeah. Um, and so I think uh, John deals a lot, the book of John overall deals a lot with Jesus' role as a, as a son and him trying to give us, show us our identity as sons of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I got time to say something. Uh, you know, in this chapter, it shows that Jesus was doing his final uh, preparation. Mm -hmm. He was preparing them for what he had to come against. Because if you notice, everyone, you know, they had their their questions because Jesus originally that they thought he was coming to uh, just uh, bring the the, the uh, Israel back, and and they were just going to triumph. And but. They they they're finding out that uh, before the cross that it's not it's not happening it's not happening so they're trusting in in Christ but they still have not seen what happens after he's gone so he's mm -hmm. preparing them for when he comes when he raises again then they will remember all of this that he's getting them ready for that's what he's getting them ready for. And so, uh, yeah, because none of them have any power. They all weak. They all scared. They they don't know what to do. But uh, in, in a minute, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah, they're gonna see what 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 is really all about after he comes back. And then it's it's all gonna come back to them. Yeah. They'll have power. Yeah, they won't be weak. Amen. <clears throat> I think I have like maybe two points for for this chapter. Mm -hmm. But the first one we kind of covered in uh, like a, a more looser way. So I'll kind of try to, you know, draw more out of it. But I was just thinking when I was reading this is that there's a difference. Obviously, we, we kind of already know this. There's a difference between believing in Jesus, but then loving Jesus, right? Because you mentioned it says, he who loves me will keep my commandments. Mm, that's it's it. not necessarily he who is saved keeps my commandments it's he who loves me mm. like there's, there's two categories mm -hmm. there are a lot of people that are saved because the bible doesn't say you have to do everything right to be saved that's right. it says you must believe in your heart that jesus is lord and that god raised him from the dead and confess yeah. with your mouth mm -hmm. right so if you do right. those two things you're saved yeah. but to love jesus that's how you unlock the anointing Amen. Right. That's how you walk in power. That's Amen. how you do things that actually make a difference. That's how you help to actually build the kingdom of God. Because he yep. says, he who wins souls is wise. Amen. But you can't win souls if you're not able to speak against the things that people are going through. Right. The only way you can do that is if you overcome some things yourself. Like if, if you fail to all of your battles, how can you speak inspiration into someone else's battles? Right. You can't because right. you haven't been there. Yeah. Yeah. So I believe it's like two steps, right? So belief in Jesus is the first step. And that's just salvation, right? You believe in him and you confess him. That's the first step. But that, that first step has to be completed 
before you can complete the second step. That's so right. you can't love Jesus unless you believe in him. That's right. You, so you can't keep his commandments unless you believe in him. Right. A, a lot of us can see this because when we speak to people that's in the world, they think they're good people. Hey, we thought we were good people before we were saved. We're like, I, I'm a good person. I've done some good things. I, I, I don't do that. I may do this, this, and this, but I don't do that. I wouldn't right. have nobody. We thought we were good people. Yeah. Right. But he says, he who loves me keeps my commandments. Right. That's, yeah. that's what he's looking for. Yeah. So I have to believe in Jesus before I can keep his commandments. That's right. That's right. So you can believe in him, but not love him. Yeah. Right. A lot of people in the church, we believe, but we don't love him. The devil believes. <laughs> right. But then you can complete, you, you cannot complete the second step without the first one being complete. Amen. That's right. So you can't keep the commandments without loving him because right. it's it's your love of Jesus, your love of God that puts the desire in you to keep the commandments. It has to be a heavenly desire. It's not a natural thing that's in us that tells us, you know, read your word, you know, go to attend church, um, you know, forsake not the gathering of, of yourselves together. Forget right. not brotherly love. Like these are not the things that you think of as a human. You just think, well, if I do more good than bad, I'm a good person. That's our natural brain. If I do more good than bad, I'm a good person. But God is like, if you've done one thing bad, you're not good enough. Yeah, it Period. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So this difference between believing and loving is a difference established of obedience mm. or the lack thereof. So obviously we see John 14, 15, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. But then I want to look at James because James is really, he brings a lot of context to it, right? Because he's talking about faith and works. He's like, you say you have faith and another person may say, I have works, right? We see this even in a church today. There's, there's a specific group of, of, of church members, right? They may be compromised, but they have faith. They do believe that Jesus is the one true Lord. They do believe that he is the savior of the world but they don't show it, right? So they believe this. Then you have another group of people who have all works, which is usually it's, it's the Roman Catholics. They have a lot of works, but they don't actually believe that Jesus is the only way. They don't believe that he's the only way to salvation. So James chapter two, verses 19 to 24, it says, you believe that there is one God and you do well. He says, even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works, faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. So even though you can believe, you're not actually justified, right? Until you actually let that belief, that desire in you birth a new, a, a new heart. Because of that new heart, birth these new works, right? These new works don't happen if you don't truly believe him, yeah. right? So he, yeah. he says, do you not see that faith is working together with his works? And by works, your faith is made perfect. This is what we see in Peter when we're talking about the previous chapter. You believe in me. You believe that I'm the son of God. He had already said, I believe that you're the son of God. He says, will you guys leave me like the others left me? He says, we, we have nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. And plus, we, we've come to believe that you are the only begotten son of God, right? So we know that who, this is who you are. But he says, your faith is not made perfect yet because your faith is made perfect by your works. That's right. So even though you believe in me, you still finna deny me three times. Because you, ha you haven't really grown yet. You haven't been mature yet. You haven't completed this process yet. Mm -hmm. So I think that just shows us that it's, it's, a, it's bigger than this. It's bigger than just salvation. Though that is the, the main thing. It's bigger than that. And that's where a lot of people stop at. Because it's comfortable. It's comfortable to just be saved, but not make any changes. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. When yeah. you start having to make those changes, that's mm -hmm. when you start seeing the black and white. Like, it's good or evil. I'll tell you this, like in my previous job, I was working a couple months ago. I had a boss. She was a lady. She you know, was running this marketing company. And she would always tell me because the way I did the business, like there was multiple ways you could address it. But I always looked at everything black and white. And she would always say this. And when she would like complain to me about this, I never saw nothing wrong with it. 
So I really couldn't grow in that business because I just, her perspective wasn't my perspective. We couldn't, we didn't share the same thoughts. She would be like, you look at everything as black and white, but there's gray. And I'm like, well, how do you keep saying that? I understand that there's gray, but there's no gray for me. That's all like, it's no gray for me. I understand you. I understand the people. I understand what needs to be done, but I'm not willing to do that. So like, that's one thing I think about when it comes to even preaching the word. When you think of things as black and white, that's good for us personally. But if you don't, if you're not able to understand the gray, then how can you be effective in preaching the gospel? Not that you have to see it, but you have to understand what people are thinking. Like when I do ministry, when I do, when I make these sermons, these messages, I have to think about if I say this, what is a person going to react with? Like, how will you react to what I'm telling you? Because I want to answer, I want to answer your question before you ask me. I don't want you to say something and leave you with a thousand more questions. I want to say something and go so in depth that you have no more questions. Mm -hmm. So who said that? And why did he say that? Right. Where do you get that from? So like, I'm thinking of all the questions you're going to ask before you ask them. And that's me considering that gray area. If I'm saying this to any old person, they may not understand it because it sounds black and white. So I'm thinking about what's your response going to be so I can address that before it even happens. And that's how I get that full understanding out. So I think that that kind of, you know, relates to that black and white in the gray area perspective as well, where it's like, I don't have to live in the gray, but I have to understand the gray to be effective mm-hmm. in ministry. I have to know how to talk to all kinds of people, right? Paul says, I become all things that I may win some. Yeah. So I become all things to all people. You know, you, you know how to, how to relate to those people. You know how to have a conversation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. And second part is just the heavenly hierarchy, right? Which is like the structure of power. So our submission to Jesus, it brings him glory, right? This glorifies Jesus because we're submitted to him. But the submission of Jesus brings the Father glory. So John 13 and 16 says, Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. And that second part is is talking specifically about Jesus, because he was sent to the world to be the propitiation for our sins, but he was sent by the Father. So I was sent to do this, and I'm not greater than my father. Though I'm equal to my father, I'm not greater than him, right? He sent me, and that's why Jesus always submitted to the father. Everything he does, he's he's speaking of, I'm only doing what I saw my father in heaven do, right? Everything comes back to submission to the father, because when he does that, it it gives the father glory, but it also shows us an an example. So as the disciples, like, like as disciples, they don't necessarily know the father intimately like Jesus does. They were never in heaven, but they know Jesus. So when they submit to him in his word, which he received from the father, it not only glorifies Jesus, but then it also glorifies the father. Yep. Right. So it's that hierarchy. You glorify your master by doing what your master tells you. Yep. And his master is glorified in him because he's doing what he's telling them. So it's, it's a perfect flow of that power, yep. perfect flow of the anointing, right? So when Jesus tells his disciples to follow me, he's not only referring to following in action, but to follow him in the heart, right? Which means to submit, like have the heart of submission, Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, don't think, a lot of us, you know, we think because we're doing something great or we've gotten promoted, different things like that, that we're somebody special. And Jesus is showing you, I'm the son of God. I am God. And I'm still willing to die for sin, a sin that I never committed. Like, I'm not doing this because I am supposed to. I'm doing this because I want to. I'm doing this because I love you enough to do this. And this is what we also ought to be able to do. So John 4 and 24 says this, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So when I think of that scripture, I'm like, the spirit, right? That's God's righteousness. But the truth is simple, right? It's it's Walking in truth is our actions, right? We know what is true, so we do what's true. Mm -hmm. But you can be doing what's true and still have the wrong heart, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You can be doing all the right things with the wrong heart. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that comes to worship him in in the spirit, right? You got to have the Holy Spirit. You got to be doing it in, in truth from the heart, right? So if it's just action without the actual justification, which is in the heart, it means nothing. But vice versa, if it's all in the heart, but the actions aren't there, it also means nothing. You have to have both parts. Mm -hmm. Right. So those are the two things I got from that passage from John chapter 14. 
And um, I don't know, did you guys get anything else or maybe you want to discuss some things I was talking about? That was good. I want to say one quick thing. Um, let me see how to word this. Um, love, loving God. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Um, so so when, when we do not keep commandments, we show a lack of love. When we do keep God's commandments, we show love. But, but what I've, what I've, uh, what I've grown to understand more too is that if we love God with the right mind, like you said, in the spirit and in, in God's righteousness, you know, we do it, be, you know, we, we obey God because we love him. You know, mm -hmm. when, when the word, when the word of God, uh, when we start uh, putting God's word into practice in our life, mm -hmm. we can either become religious <laughs> or we could become intimate with God. You know, and I think that all boils down to perspective because some people just do uh, yeah. things obligatory right. and, and they never change. Mm -hmm. But if we're living according to the word because we just love our father mm -hmm. and this is our identity, amen, there you go. We, re we, re we recognize that this is my new identity. This is who I am in Christ. This is who I am as a son. Amen. When we start doing it like that, we actually grow to love God in the physical even more. Because the word of God, when it starts to take root in us, I'm telling you, it's something about the word. It yes. creates that passion, that yes. zeal, that love. You you have this 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 zeal that wants to turn away from every sin. Yes. I'm telling you, yes. you know, it, it just it, you you start to hate sin yes. in your own life, mm. and, and you're not condemned because you know Jesus paid the price for you. But that makes you even want to overcome more because of His love for you. Mm, yeah. Amen. So I'm just saying. That was Go what ahead, I man. was trying to explain. Um, my husband did a much better job of, of articulating the battle between that rebel and the orphan Ooh. spirit that Jesus came to resolve. Ooh. He came to give us our identity in him so that we would not take on the world's identity and get our value from the things of the world, titles, jobs, looks, fame, money, but that we would know that the true value is in being a child of God. And a child, a true child, a devoted child wants to please their parent, mm -hmm. even to the point of denying themselves. And that's what Jesus demonstrated as a son. He was a mature son. Mm -hmm. he, he demonstrates that throughout his life um, in his, his walk, his from childhood on to his ministry and then ultimately yielding to death on the cross and then God demonstrating his faithfulness and raising him from the dead. And so I, 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 that's what I was trying to explain that, that battle that we, we experience um, to, so that we don't get stuck in that religious mindset that the Pharisees were stuck in mm -hmm. um, yeah. where they thought they could kind of earn God's righteousness oh, they can earn it yeah through mm -hmm. words so even with pleasing God you know uh we can't get caught up with a works a works based um, relationship mm -hmm. you know when when God is pleased because we we have faith it says without faith it is impossible to please God so with faith, we're manifesting the word, right? Yeah. We, 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 we taking the word, the heart, and we're, we're manifesting this identity. Paul said it this way. He said that the people, uh, as believers, we should be walking epistles, right? We're walking, you know, we're walking, we're walking epistles. We are the word. We, we are walking out the word because Amen. the word lives in us. Amen. 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 Glory to him. Yeah. He needs his glory. Yes, he does. He his glory. I wanted to say real quick that uh, I know a lot of times the uh, 
depending on what kind of uh, physical father that people have here, it's hard for them to uh, relate to how God truly is. And it's kind of like what you guys are just talking about being an orphan and all that. As far as me, I didn't have a father in my life. So my slate was like clean. So I was able to, you know, really know the Lord and get to know him as my father. But um, I think you were talking about too, Pastor Devin, that about meeting people where they're at and, and uh, relating to them um, with the things that they go through. But I know that their father and the way they view the father that they had, some things are hard for them to get past, but it all goes back to that, you know, uh, God is here for us as orphans and as we are to get to know him through his word. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Totally agree with all that. Anybody else have any uh, final comments? Well, I just like to say it all boils down to love um, because if you love, you're going to want to know. If you love, you're going to want to do. Yeah, so it all comes down to love. And like I said, when we, when the fruits of the spirit are seen, and that's how we know so that a tree is known by the fruit it bears. So if, if we're connected, people will see, people will notice. They'll know if it's fake fruit. They'll know if it's, it's real fruit. They'll know if it's the true fruit. If we're walking in love, and the only way we're going to walk in love is to look to Christ and what, what he has done. Mm -hmm. And that's what, like, so that's what Christ was getting uh, us ready for in, uh, in the, those uh, scriptures there in John, uh, you know, for what he was about to do in our lives. And so he has given us everything we need. So all we do, because we love him, because we love him, that's why we do what we do. And if we love others, that's why we want to reach out to others in love because we don't want them to perish. Amen. 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 Great session, everybody. I just wanted to say so much good stuff to share from everybody. All oh, you shared some great stuff. Praise Amen. the Lord. Amen. Amen. So <clears throat> as you guys already know, we're doing the next couple of chapters should be John 15 and 16 coming up next Thursday. And there's also only 21 chapters in John. So, you know, soon we're going to be, you know, maybe just discussing like what book do we want to tackle next? Um, and just going from there. Amen. I mean, other than that, who would like to close us out in prayer? I can. <laughs> I can. Amen. Okay. Father God in heaven, uh, our Lord and our God, our Father, precious Father, Lord, we feel so blessed tonight. Father, we feel full up by your word, Heavenly Father, but God, we want you to feed us till we won't no more, Lord, and that will never be, Heavenly Father. Thank you so much for your word tonight. Thank you for Jesus preparing uh, the way, being the way, the truth, and the life, Father, and just the encouragement that he gave the disciples, Lord, and let them know what was going on and the demonstration of love or washing their feet, Lord, showing us that we should be that way with one another, especially to the house of the believers, Lord. We just ask, Father, that tonight, Father, that anybody in need of prayer, Heavenly Father, God, you know what they need. Some people need you for some things and some people need you for other things, Father, but you're omnipotent, God. You know all, Father, God. We just pray that you're with them, their families, our families, Heavenly Father, God, is uh, that you protect them, God, and keep a hedge of protection around them, God, as they go to and fro and come back home, Father. We just thank you so much for the word tonight of everyone here. Father, we pray all this in your son, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.